I'm Virginia Trioli. We're coming to you live tonight from Sydney. Joining me on the panel, researcher of the report we'll be discussing tonight, author and renowned feminist Anne Summers. Labor Minister and domestic violence survivor Anne Ali. Award-winning author and survivor Veronica Gorey. Anti-domestic violence campaigner Arman Abrahim Zadeh and author Jess Hill, who wrote the award-winning book, See What You Made Me Do. Please make them all feel very welcome. So it's because of men's use of violence that women are facing this terrible choice between staying in abuse or poverty and homelessness. Yet the societal message is still so often, why doesn't she just leave? Which places the responsibility with her. So I'm wondering what the panellists think could be done to shift the responsibility from the user of violence, uh, sorry, to the user of violence, and how we could change the normalised narrative that expects women to physically leave the home when they're in an abusive relationship. Marty, thank you. Um, and Summers, the, the massive report that you've just published, in it you talk about the irresponsibility, that's the phrase you use, the irresponsibility of a society that encourages women to leave violent relationships but doesn't provide them with adequate and safe alternatives. That's pretty much where Marty's going this evening, isn't it? Yes. Um, I mean, what I try to say in the report and what motivate, motivated me to do this work and to do this research was the fact that I felt that the conversation about domestic violence in this country wasn't going anywhere. That, I mean, Rosie Batty did an incredible job in raising awareness of it. I think the issue is very much on the political agenda. We're very aware of it, but nothing's changed. And I felt one of the reasons that nothing has changed is that the data hasn't changed. We, are, we don't know enough about what's happening. Mm. And that, that is what motivated me to go and do this very in-depth research from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and get, get never-before-published data about just how bad it really is. Now, one, the, the, the data is mainly about women as victims, uh, and, and what, that's what I looked at. There are certainly uh, programs that are, um, I think, somewhat controversial. Uh, as to whether or not the woman should stay at home, stay in the home and the man be made, be made to leave. Um, and that certainly sounds much fairer, uh, but it's often not safer mm. and it's not practical. Uh, so I don't think uh, that, that is the way, that is not the solution. It's certainly not the immediate solution. I mean, the immediate solution facing so many women, I mean, that, the numbers that I have, uh, which are based on the ABS numbers, that there are 275,000 women in Australia in 2016, the number probably about the same now, who live with a violent partner. 275,000, that's a lot of women. 90,000 yeah. of them wanted to leave but couldn't, many of them because of lack of money. So the, the ones who did leave uh, and, and, and are now single mothers as a result, 185,700 of them who experienced violence, they were all married at the time they were experiencing the violence, but mm. they left and became single mothers and 50% of them are now living in Poverty. Let me just spool through a couple of the, the, the key findings, and it, it's a, a massive and, and weighty report, but they include the high number of women who experience violence and are now single mothers with kids under 18, the high number of women who wanted to leave but couldn't because they couldn't afford to, the high number of women who left but came back because they couldn't survive financially, and the women who were not in poverty before they left but were after, after leaving. Mm. So it's, it's, it's astonishing and it's painting a picture and a connection, a nexus now, between domestic violence and poverty that we haven't had before. And I think that's, that's probably the main takeaway that I hope people get from this report, and that is that, you know, for a long time it's been... The, the, the presupposition has been that violence is, cause, is the cause of domestic violence yeah. and only poor people suffer it. And it happens in, you know, poor suburbs and everybody else, it's, you know, if it happens, it's just an occasional thing. That is not the case. I mean, we don't know the uh, incidents via postcode, unfortunately, but I think if we did know, we'd be very shocked at, at how high the incidence is, regardless of where people live. Um, what we do, do know is that... Um, leaving a relationship um, of whatever kind. I mean, some of the people that were looked at in uh, an associated work that was done on Hilda statistics, which are uh, longitudinal ones and give us uh, inf information over time, some of the men involved in that, the, that these women left were earning up to $600,000 a year. And uh, those women's income, household incomes declined 
by as much as 45% after they left. Let me get to the rest of the panel on this and uh, Marty's question in particular about expecting women to leave. Anne Ali, I know you've had a particular and personal experience of this and we're happy to hear whatever you're prepared to share this evening. But what are your reflections on that question? Um, I think, Marty, to um, respond to your question, I think we need to be changing that question. It shouldn't, we shouldn't be asking, why don't women leave? We should be asking, why do women have to leave? And then we should be asking, what happens when they leave? Why do they have to leave? And then what happens when they leave? If we start asking those two questions as a society, the answers that we'll get are very different to the answer of why don't women leave, I think. Um, let me tell you, it is the hardest thing I ever did in my life to leave. And I've done some pretty hard stuff. Right? The most difficult thing I ever had to do in my life was leave. Um, because I had two children. I had two boys. I didn't want them to be without a father. And there's all this society expectation of, you know, children being raised, boys being raised with their father. I knew that I was leaving to lead a life of poverty. And the humiliation of walking into that Centrelink office mm. and saying, I don't know how I'm going to feed my kids or myself, still sits with me 30 years on. Mm. After everything that I went through, the hardest thing was to leave. <clears throat> That's why women don't leave. Let me turn to Veronica Gorey on this, Veronica. Uh, I just want to talk about the report, go back to the report. And um, so I did read your report, all 101 pages, I believe. Um, and what I, what I took from that was the exclusion of Aboriginal women. There's no data in relation to Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander women. Um, and also I found that your report was quite um, gender biased. Like we're talking about um, women being victims right now, but men are also victims as well. And other people from the LGBTQI plus community, however they identify themselves, are victims as well. And your report only, um, the victim is only the woman. I found that upsetting as well. Um, and with, as an Aboriginal person, like it's about, sorry? No, oh, just, just wait one second. I'll get, I'll get a response from... I was from... asking Virginia if I could respond to I'll that. I'll get a response from Anne in a moment. Yeah, I haven't yeah. finished yet, Anne. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so with Aboriginal people, we don't... I wish poverty was the only thing we had to worry about mm -hmm. when we're dealing with domestic violence. It's not. The violence that is... Um, um, that we suffer at the hands of police when police turn up at um, a domestic violence incident is a whole nother level. Mm. Aboriginal women are deemed to be um, the perpetrators and are locked up and our children are taken from us. That's not in your report, which I find upsetting. Um, and although we're not in the report, um, the federal government have announced an, um, an action plan to address family violence and domestic violence within our communities without no data. Mm. And that's very telling. It's um, state-sanctioned violence. Veronica, I, we've got a number of questions that yeah. take us to all of those points, so I hope to, to flesh them out as the evening goes on. And I will come back to you for a response in a moment, if I can, Anne. But, uh, Aman, let me come to you and, and, and our questioner about women leaving, because we may get to your personal story a little bit later in the mm. program. Mm. But how would you respond to Marty? I think uh, the way... Um, Minister Ali uh, responded in Anne, terms of... please call me Anne. Anne. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, responded in terms of what happens to these women when they leave. That's been a, um, uh, a key component that's been missing because we always talk about uh, family and domestic violence and the different fronts that is being fought on. Mm. And I think now with the draft um, national plan being released, we've got four pillars that have been identified and that's essentially prevention, the early intervention, uh, the, uh, the, the crisis uh, uh, end, but also the recovery, the post-crisis. Now, that's been missing uh, from that conversation for a long time. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, saw, we saw that gap about seven years ago, and that's why we went along in South Australia and established a, a foundation that actually addresses that gap mm -hmm. and tries to uh, assist women uh, in order to carve uh, a brand new path for themselves, a path that's free of <laughs> violence and abuse. 
And the questions tonight that take us to the issue of post-crisis and the fact that we've perhaps front-end loaded the issue with uh, warnings and exhortations for women to leave but not provided them with the support to actually get out. Mm -hmm. Jess Hill, this question really is fundamental to the book that you wrote. Yeah, Marty, thanks so much for the question. And when I was writing the book, it was so interesting how ingrained it was in me to foreground the victim that I had to switch around the chapters to put the perpetrators right up front. And that felt very um, unnatural. Uh, and a lot of my learning, and this comes particularly from victim survivors themselves, over the, over the time has been to try to put the perpetrator back at the front of the sentence, you know, that we're talking, like, it's just good English to put the subject of the sentence at the beginning rather, you know. So, um, and of course, when we're talking in this kind of heterosexual framework, which is sort of where we're talking tonight because we're thinking about single mothers, you know, we talk a lot about women's safety. We have a women's safety summit. Um, we have a plan for women's safety. We don't have a plan for men's violence. And it's, you know, when you don't have that lens on the actions of perpetrators, all you see is the resulting choices and the resulting behaviours, um, but it doesn't come back to what drove those behaviours. Those behaviours aren't operating in a vacuum. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, it's difficult, the thing around, you know, why should women leave? I mean, a part of one of the big awakenings I had when I finally got over all my own stereotypes was... I just came to think, how on earth does she leave? And why, if he treats her so badly and seems to despise her, why doesn't he let her leave? Mm. Because actually this, when especially in, in, um, in terms of coercive control, but in most family violence, it's not just abuse, it's entrapment, mm -hmm. you know? And, and as Anne says, like the act of leaving is utterly terrifying and the women who leave often are, it's a high stakes operation that takes planning and preparation because he will not let her leave and he may kill her for leaving. Let me get to some other questions, but Anne, I'll just give you a moment just to briefly respond if you, if you can to Veronica's criticisms. Well, well I mean, I, I have no, no argument with Veronica. The problem uh, with, with the uh, collection of the statistics that we use, the personal safety survey, which is the federal government's uh, survey every four years of, of violence uh, and safety in Australia, and which includes domestic violence, does not include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at all. Why? Why, why is it? Well, the reason they give is they say it's, it's, it's a sampling problem. They can't get to remote communities. It's a household survey. Um, this is their argument. I can't, I'm not defending it. I'm just <laughs> saying that's what, they, what, what the situation is. Uh, similarly with LGBT. So, so, I, I so, don't believe that. It's because we don't matter. Our lives don't matter. That They don't give a shit about Aboriginal people. Um, they don't give a shit about Aboriginal victims. And I'm not bringing gender into it either, like you want to, Jess. It's not about men or women. And women come in all forms, OK? You know? But um, they don't, I, they don't I, care so about Aboriginal I, I, I did... Well, I'm, I made the point that that was a criticism. I criticised yeah. that point in, in, in what I wrote. Similarly with um, LGBTQ people uh, who are included in the latest study, mm. uh, have been included in previous studies. So the study itself is evolving. Uh, this idea for having a separate plan for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is... I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I agree with that. I think I'm interested in what you think of that, whether or not that they should be integrated into the national survey I think is is the way to go. I think we can, do, we can do our own survey actually um, and we can look after our own problems. My name is Katrina Harrison. I'm a strong Palawa woman. I've had years of family violence and now I work in the sector. It's traumatic to live with family violence, but it's even more so traumatic to be forced to walk through a broken racist system. My question is, what will it take to support women escaping violence, particularly Aboriginal women? Veronica, let's get you to answer that question. Well, first, we, we, we've got to stop police um, misidentifying us as perpetrators. So we don't have, as Aboriginal victims, we don't have the luxury of um, forethinking the process of family courts. We're also thinking about our criminal matters as well, from being incarcerated, wrongfully incarcerated, 
Um, yeah, and you've, you've made a really interesting point in the past, yeah. actually, Veronica, about how um, a, a, Aboriginal women are often seen in that you know, situation of uh, leaving, fleeing or complaining of family violence as a bad victim. What do you mean by, you know, the, the bad victim? Well, we're victim? not good victims. We're yeah. not believed. Um, and I think it's... You're not the right kind of victim. Yeah, we're not the right... We're not, we're not the white victim. Um, white is right, right? Um, but also I want to raise the case, and, and I'll use this as an example, um, Tamika Mulloway in... Um, yeah. And you know this case. It was on your show in episode two, um, See What You Made Me Do. Um, you know, and while I appreciate that you brought that, that her particular story to attention, the media attention that it deserved, because um, all too often you don't hear about um, the, the mm. incidences that are happening to Aboriginal people. Mm because we don't make the news. Veronica, can I take you back to the question? Yep. Uh, for, as someone who knows this area well, who's worked as a police officer, who's escaped family violence, who's been in, yep. come from a family, uh, a place of violence yourself as a young person, what are the policy changes you would like to see? What are the settings changes that, that your community need? Well, in relation to Aboriginal people, we don't, we don't want police coming to, uh, to us. That's, we don't even call police, for Christ's sakes because we know the likelihood of us getting arrested is really high. So, and usually the first people we ring or telephone in when we have crisis is our family anyway, and that's cultural. So I think more money should be given to Aboriginal organisation that's culturally appropriate, that we trust. Um, in Victoria, right now, we have JIRA. Um, that's a family violence, Aboriginal family violence-led organisation. And we have a men's healing one that addresses the, um, in some cases, the perpetrators um, and that's um, Dadi Manwaro. So more funding should be provided to these Aboriginal organisations. As an example of what you're speaking about, I know that in, in your personal history, uh, your your child, I think, was was handed to the partner you were fleeing, yeah. and uh, and and was taken off with with the partner. And yeah, it was because because obviously I didn't make a good vi victim. But um, and what people who have never experienced family violence is that when you're in a relationship and you've been um, You've been forced to be submissive, um, compliant, and um, and you, you've seen and not heard that when you, you when police do ten, attend, in particular when it's Aboriginal people, mm. and it's by the way I wasn't calling the police; they were called to the um, situation. Um, it's our opportunity. We take that opportunity to speak up, and so we, we're seen to be hysterical. We're seen and deemed to be um, suffering from a mental illness, and we're treated like shit and our children are taken from us. We've heard um, from many of you in particularly vulnerable communities and we want to represent as many voices as we can tonight. So our next question comes from Kat Reid. Hi everyone. Um, I am a board member of Women with Disabilities Australia and the CEO of Women with Disabilities ACT. And we know across Australia, women and girls with disability experience significantly higher forms of all forms of, of violence than non-disabled women, including many that remain legal and state sanctioned, such as forced sterilisation and other forms of reproductive violence. While Australia has policies, frameworks and services to address violence against women, many of these use narrow definitions of domestic and family violence, which means that women with disability and the types of gender-based violence we experience are excluded. My question for the panel tonight is, how can we ensure that women with disability are meaningfully included and the forms of gender-based violence we experience, including domestic and family violence, are addressed? Thanks for that question. And Summers, I'll turn to you on that. Well, this is something that I do raise in my report and, and one of the most um, disturbing figures, in fact, in the report is the, the rate of uh, disability amongst um, women who have experienced um, physical and, and uh, sexual violence. Uh, the rate is, um, just must check it, is, is um, 45% uh, of, of, the, of the women in, um, in, in this survey suffered a, phys a physical or an intellectual disability compared with 18% for the entire population. The, one of the questions that, that I ask and, and can't be answered from this, because this is a cross-sectional survey, it only surveys it gets information from a certain point of time. It doesn't give you what happened before and what happened yeah. after. But, but the extent of the disability is so severe, particularly the physical um, um, disability, and it, it seems to me it correlates so closely with the descriptions of physical violence that are, that are, are meted out towards women in these family situations that there has to be a cause and effect there. 
So I think that we need urgent um, study, an urgent investigation into uh, the extent to which uh, the disabilities are the result of domestic violence. Um, they also can then become a cause of domestic violence because we know that women who experience disabilities are then often that triggers violence in their partner. Um, even if he's the person, or even particularly if he's the person who has caused the disability in the first place. So I think it's a really hugely important issue and it's one that needs to be investigated. And uh, we'll need sort of f formal data collection and, and tracking in order to make sure that, that the, the extent of the issue <coughs> is known and that the numbers yes. are actually counted. Yes. Uh, the panel spoken quite a bit tonight about poverty and I want to put the idea of early intervention into a broader context and that is generational. So I wonder if the panel has any suggestions for how we could do better as a society at supporting family networks in breaking the cycles of violence. Uh, Aman, let me turn to you on this because you've said something that, that really shocked me when I learnt of, of your reflections on this, given what you grew up with and what your father did to your mother. And um, you said that if your dad hadn't killed your mother, that you probably would have turned out to be a different person. What do you mean? Uh, well, um, I think I got to a point where um, uh, when we fled our family home, I was about 21, and uh, I started to uh, very slowly piece the... Um, connect the dots, essentially, and uh, look at our situation and how we ended up and why we ended up in the situation that we were in. And it was all... Uh, uh, I guess, you know, it was all related to the 21 years of, um, uh, of controlling behaviour, manipulation, financial abuse, emotional abuse. Um, all of that sits... Uh, underneath, and I guess you know, the attempted murder and the murder is really at the top of the iceberg. That, that's what we hear about in the media. That's sure. what we see. That's what we count. Mm. Um, it wasn't until my mum passed away uh, that I started to realise that um, some of the traits that I had picked up from uh, watching my parents interact and uh, the way my dad acted, what he said, how he went about his, his business. I started to, uh, to to copy that, and I'd been doing that uh, since my teenage years, and I could clearly see that in the relationships that I was in. So uh, uh, I, I, I guess I noticed that all of that abuse, the 20 years of abuse, essentially led to my dad killing my mum. And I, so, I, I, uh, are you saying that if that if that dreadful murder hadn't taken place, that you might have grown up to be an abuser yourself? An emotional abuser, uh, con someone that was jealous, controlling, manipulative, yes. So I saw that in my early relationships. Yeah. And, and I had to reflect and say, this is, not the, this is not the right path. Just because I've been exposed to it and, and that's just because it happened in my family home mm. doesn't mean that it doesn't make it right. I so, don't think that's proven, though. Is it proven? No, look, cos I've... Like, my, my son's witnessed a lot of violence towards me and he is an amazing Aboriginal man. He's reflected. Is, like, is this... Is it proven? I that think... if you, you... As a child, if you witness yeah. so much but like, violence... Well, I think this is, you... um, this is Arman's experience, though, of how, oh, okay. how he believed, mm. you know, he was turning out as a result of this. So, Arman, what did you do? I mean, cos I know that you're a father now with a young child, so... Uh, I am. So, what, what did I do? Um, um, I guess in my uh, teenage years, I started to... As, as relationships weren't working out, I started to reflect and, and look at uh, who was at fault and uh, what went wrong. Uh, and as I started to, to grow up, I started to um, actually understand that what was happening at home, I was essentially replicating that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as I said, all the, the different forms of abuse that I had witnessed and experienced, I was uh, uh, recreating that in, in my own relationships. And so uh, I, I think I, I got to a point where I started to realise that if I keep going down this path, chances are I'm, I'm either going to hurt my partner or or do even worse. And when I saw what my dad did to my mum, that didn't happen overnight. My dad didn't just get up um, one night and say, I'm gonna go and kill this lady. That didn't happen overnight. It, it took 22 years. Yeah. From my perspective, it was 22 years of abuse. And, it, and, and even that, it started with very subtle behaviours and, and as time went on, it started to build up. What, what do you tell younger people or people who might be in a similar situation to you that you were in as a young man? What advice, what leadership do you give to them on that? Uh, look out for early warning signs. 
And, and just because something is happening at home, um, that doesn't necessarily make it right. Mm. For me, I had uh, my friends and their families, and that's where I essentially started to compare that what was happening at home, at my house, and what was happening in my uh, friends' family places um, were, were two different things. And you had young children. How did you make sure that you were interrupting the cycle with that generation? I protected my children fiercely. My boys didn't know anything about what I went through until they read it in my book a couple of years ago. They had no idea. What I was protected their response? them fiercely. They, um, they rang me and they said, why didn't you tell us? And I said, because I, I didn't want you to be a part of, of that world. I didn't want you to know. But, you know, I think there are, um, you know, the other night I was having dinner with a girlfriend and inevitably, whenever I'm having dinner with a girlfriend, we end up talking about domestic violence. And she looked at me and she said, what are we going to do, Anne? And I said, you know what? Do you reckon the men are sitting around halfway through their state <laughs> putting down their knife and fork and going, what are we going to do about domestic violence? I think men need to start having the conversation with men mm. a lot more. <laughs> Um, so the US Supreme Court decision overturning Roe versus Wade has meant abortion is now illegal for many Americans. Um, it's likely that domestic violence perpetrators will use this ruling as part of violence and coercion against their victims. In Australia, we know that abortion still sits in the criminal code in Western Australia, and we also know that it's inaccessible for many people due to the cost and the location. So just interested in thoughts around how we support people who are affected by reproductive coercion. Can I come to you on that first? For Could you repeat it? Because I've lost the mic and I can't hear. Oh, Sorry. no. no uh, uh, so just let, repeat. Let me help you, absolutely. It's a, about the, the Roe versus Wade decision in the uh, United States, the Supreme Court decision, and how uh, there can be better support for victims, survivors of reproductive coercion, people who have been forced to carry children to term that they didn't want to carry in the first place. And I guess to ensure that it doesn't actually happen over here in Australia, as well, it has in America. You, you hear about those cases where women are like in violent relationships and they're um, told not to take any um, birth control. Birth control. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a, a way of keeping them in that relationship by getting them pregnant and then mm. making them feel like they need to be like have a both the child needs both parents. Mm. So that's that's happening. But um, it's really sad what's happening over in the US at the moment. It's, um, a it's pretty much a dictatorship. And for the women over there or anyone that's have, have uteruses, it's like they don't have autonomy over their own body part. I want to ask Anne Summers, you're a close watcher of American politics. You spent a long time there and you've worked out of the highest office in the land here as an advisor to Paul Keating. I is it possible that this sort of anti-abortion push could actually take fire here in Australia? Well, I would like to think not. Um, and I do think there are su such significant differences between the two countries. I mean, abortion has always been, you know, at least for the last 50 years, um, a a an issue that has divided uh, Americans in ways that are quite incomprehensible in this country. I mean, in this country, it's something like 70 or 80 per cent of people believe abortion should be legal and available. So that's not to deny that there are uh, issues of access, particularly in large states like Queensland and, and, West and affordability. Yeah. And affordability, uh, though it is covered in, by Medicare in most situations, I believe. Um, there's also access to uh, RU486, to, you know, to, to non-surgical forms of abortion um, increasingly, and that is, that, that's, that's helpful. But I think the problem with the United States is that, and the thing that makes me so kind of angry about it, is that the Republicans have been saying for 50 years they were going to do this. And then they made it a litmus test in, in all their judicial appointments, local courts, federal courts, Supreme Court. They finally got the Supreme Court. They made it a litmus test in the pre-selection of all their members of parliament, members of Congress, state, local, federal level. They said we we're going to do it and, and they've done it. So why, why should anyone be surprised? Why didn't we stop it? Why didn't we stop it? I mean, I just, I, I'm just baffled by the attitude of the Democrats and their inability um, to match the Republicans' 
evil intent. I just find it extraordinary. Mm -hmm. and I, but I do not think that the that, that same thing would happen in Australia. I don't and know. Ali, do you? Um, I, I, I just wanted to go back to something that Kat said, because Kat made a very important point here where she said the narrow definition of family and domestic violence. And if we, like, look at coercive control, that needs to be in the definition of family and domestic violence, mm. financial control, including and as well control that forces women to carry mm. uh, to term um, children that, that whether it's through a rape or, or whatever. I think that if we were to, you know, if we want to talk about prevention, we do really need to broaden what we, what we talk about when we talk about family and domestic violence, incorporate all of those different forms of abuse in it. So re reproductive coercion would, should actually be included as a as a term, I as a, as a recognised form of abuse. I think, Is yeah, that something I think that you we need to look at. Including I think in, in the government's policy. Um, I've just had that idea now, so maybe I'll. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pat. <laughs> no ideas, personally. <laughs> uh, Jess, did you want to jump in there? Oh, I just want you know. I think there's some data in Anne's report that talks about the fact that for so many women, and I'm sorry the number fails me, but it might not fail you, Anne, um, that, you know, that pregnancy is the first time violence occurs. Yeah. Um, and there is, uh, there was a woman in, in, um, in the book that I wrote who talked about she'd had a really supportive partner, believed in her independence and gender equality, and then the day she announced that she was pregnant, he turned on a dime and became one of the most terrifying coercive controllers and users of physical and sexual violence that I've practically ever heard. Um, now, there are so many, you know, a lot of people thought like, well, why would you have a baby to him? Why would you do that? It's like, for a lot of women, they won't even find out that their partner is, mm. is emotionally or physically or sexually abusive until they are yeah. pregnant. Mm. And there's a, a, a resounding uh, yeses in the room, so yeah. clearly a lot of lived experience and why of that. Is, and why is this? And why, you know, why, why does this happen? And, and what drives that? Mm. What Let's... drives that and how do we stop it? Mm. And that's all that we have time for tonight. So please thank our wonderful panel, Anne Summers, Anne Ali, Veronica Gori, Aman Abrahim Zadeh and Jess Hill. <laughs> and thank you for your questions and for sharing such personal stories with us and to you at home for joining the conversation as well. And we should point out that Anne's full report can be found on our website.